started and joined Tim McGraw in this 1999 episode. Tim grew up in rural Louisiana. Even as a young boy, he did well in school. His grades proved that. I didn't necessarily like it all the time, but, but I, did, I, I did pretty good in school. I didn't really have any trouble in, in school, all through high school. Um, I probably let sports get in the way a little bit too much in high school, but, but I, yeah, I, 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 did, I did all right. Growing up wasn't very easy for Tim and his family. Money was tight. It was a pretty tough road. You know, my mother is so good at, at making everything feel like a home and making us feel like that. We, you know, and, and all our friends, we, we, we didn't know any better. I mean, everybody we knew was poor, so, so I mean, it, it, I think that, that that's only the, the only stress that or the, the impact that that has on you is knowing any better. I think we didn't know any better, and, um, I, you know, I had a good childhood. My mother, my grandparents, you know, did a great job. And, raising me and my sisters. So uh, we had some tough times. We had a lot of tough times growing up. Probably, we probably think it's normal, some of the things that we went through. And, and then when you talk to other people, you realize that it really wasn't like that for everybody. It kind of makes you feel a little, little strange. But, you know, uh, I think you're your own person. And uh, you have to take responsibility for your life and the way you're going to be and not try to blame anything for that. Tim was 11 years old when he found out he was adopted. But he discovered his mother's secret before she was ready to tell him. He was looking for something in my closet, uh, something for school, and just ran across the birth certificate in a box that was stuck way back in the closet and called me at work. And it was, I think it was traumatic for him, but I think it was more traumatic for me because I knew I was going to tell him, but 11 years old was not the age I planned on telling him. But he's a very sensitive, perceptive type person, so he wasn't handled it very well for an 11 year old. You know, what do you think when you're 11 years old and you see something like that? I'm not sure what I thought. Uh, um, I know I went through a, a little bit of a tough period, but it, it wasn't anything that was, I think it was more traumatic for everyone around me than it was for me, actually. Tim found out his biological father was professional baseball player Tug McGraw. It was only when Tim got older that his relationship with Tug began. Since Faith was also adopted, it's a common tie Tim and Faith have in their relationship. We can relate to a lot in those kind of ways. And, you know, that's, to us, that's, that's just a, a personal and part of our life that, that, that we, another way that we communicate on a different level, I think, that, that makes us that much stronger. Some of the same people that knew me and knew Tim would always make a comment, and this happened right before we got together actually would say you know you should really you and that Tim McGraw need to get together and uh, I was the only thing I could think of was are you crazy <laughs> another artist I mean two of us together I don't know I can't imagine how that would possibly work it just seemed too like too much to deal with but then when I got to know him um, it was it was just so ironic, the background and how he was, where he was raised, and uh, it was just really kind of funny. We probably would have been together if we went high school. We probably would have been high school sweethearts. We were born. He's still sincere. He's still genuine. He's still kind of shy in his own way. He's kind of private, you know, and he's he's kind of shy. And, you know, he's him. Hey, CMT, we're going to go on the bus here. This this is our home. This is uh, what we spend too much time on, to tell you the truth. But uh, I'll show you a little bit of it. We're going to go in and check it out. This is our new bus designed by Faith. She spent a lot of time, putting a lot of time and effort in designing this bus, how she wanted it. So it's pretty pretty kid-friendly. Except for this, we got to get a pad on this table. Gracie keeps bumping her head on that, so we had to fix that. But back through those doors is... is Nana, who's our, our nanny, it's her room, and, and then on back is our bedroom with, with Gracie's bed that comes out from under the bed, and then there's, there's a crib back there, and it's got a really cool TV. It's like the one to the drive-in laying in bed, so, so we, we got it pretty nice back there. It's home for us, but um, up here is where Gracie spends most of her time playing, and Maggie spends most of her time on, on the floor. It's got some toys in here, back around that side under the TV. There's a lot more toys than that, thank, thank goodness. We just got off the road, so we, we got a lot of stuff off, so um. We have a computer in here, 
that swings out. I guess I can show that to you. If I can remember how to do it. I'm not very com computer literate. I don't know anything about them. I can't even turn them on, but here's a computer that kind of comes out and makes a table there that we haven't used yet because neither one of us know how to do it. But we'll get into that one of these days. But uh, we, you know, we spend a lot of time. We got a big refrigerator. That's important because we, you know, for a lot of bottles and stuff. You got your Bud Light. You got to have your Bud Light. And um, it's it's pretty much home. It's real comfortable. And uh, Hemphill Brothers, who who built this for us, this is the first time they built one of these. It's called an H3. It's the the kind of bus this is. It's a Prevost H3, but it's a it's a new model. So we're proud of it. It's it's. It's been fun. We've only been out a few times in it, but uh, so far, so good. Faith will be on this bus more than I will. I, you know, she gets this bus. And, excuse me, I get stuck out on the, on the road with my band and their bus, so I have, to, I have to go from, like, you know, the Ritz to, to Motel 6 when I go out with a band, and Faith gets to stay down here with the kids. But, but this, this is, this is uh, where I plan to be most of the time if I can get, get to them. Well, thanks, CMT, for coming by and visiting. Uh, first time I ever had a couple million people in the bus at one time, but, you know, We'll try anything. We'll see you guys later. Take care. To our 1999 episode featuring Tim McGraw. Tim isn't only involved in producing his own records. He's been working with Byron Gallimore on Joe D. Messina's albums. I knew Joe D. when I first moved to town, actually, and first met when I first met Byron Gallimore, and we were talking about what was the next step in my career. I, you know, I hadn't recorded an album yet. I've only recorded a few tracks that that, that didn't really sound good and didn't turn out good so we were trying to figure out what direction we we're going and he started playing me stuff that he'd been working on and, and a demo tape of joe d was one of the tapes he played me in, and i just fell in love with her voice she has one of those voices that she sings great and all that but there's there's an honesty to her voice and a timbre in her voice that really gets to you and that doesn't happen very often i think that's the difference between very successful artists and artists who are not as successful as some other artists there's just that little quality in their voice that they have that, that draws your attention to it and kind of perks your ears to it and touches you that, that um, you just can't learn. It just, it just has to be there and it's honest and, and Jody has that. And I remember him coming up to me. It was backstage at the Ace of Clubs and I was having a uh, showcase. I got a record deal and uh, the record company was having a showcase. They were showcasing me and Tim came backstage. Uh, we were, you know, I was all nervous. I got so scared before I went on stage that I almost went into shock. I couldn't hear anybody, and he'd come up, and he's like, hey, you know, don't, don't forget me when you make it big time. And he went out, sat in the audience, and he went to both of my showcases here in Nashville. And, uh, you know, he, he ended up making it <laughs> big time. <laughs> big time. He ended up making it. And um, he never forgot me. And I will, for the rest of my life, be indebted to Tim McGraw and his heart, his sincerity, and his you know, his giving, his kindness. I still am, to this day. <laughs> he's still, he's still there for me. When you're in the studio doing your own thing, even though you're, you're producer on it too, you kind of let your mind go a little bit so you can worry about, you, you worry more about the, the vocals and the singing. And, and although you can compartmentalize and think about everything else that's going on and try to try to put as much input as you can, you're really concerned about how lyrically how the song's gonna come across and how it's gonna work for you. So when you're a producer, or when you're not singing, I guess is what I should say, when you're when you're working on another act, it gives you a different perspective because you, you can concentrate more on how the record's gonna sound and the little intricacies that you really can't concentrate as much on at the time as it's going down when you're doing the singing. So I think it, it you can kind of broaden your horizons a little bit. And it's, it's helped me be a better artist, it's helped me when I go back in the studio to do my own work, think of things that I might have thought of and, and in another session with somebody else that, that really helps me out a lot too. So it's a learning process. It's like a full circle, it comes around both ways. Perhaps. The part about being in this business is it's hard to really go out and enjoy music and concerts sometimes because you get a little bit too caught up in how it sounds. So you can't just enjoy it. So that's one of the downsides to it. But. Uh, it, it's a, it, I learn every time I hear somebody. I hear somebody new. I hear an old record from the 70s that I love. Or anything that I listen to, I, I'm always learning something. His wealth of experience, again, as we were talking about a while ago in the music of the 70s and the 80s, and I've always heard him talk about his, uh, I guess it was his stepdad that had Charlie Pride, uh, the old light tracks, when he was a little bitty boy, and... I think Haggard, there was two or three 
of those artists that I think really shaped him a lot, plus a lot of the um, rock groups through the late 70s and 80s, uh, you know, that gave him a wealth of information. So uh, he comes in with a ton of great ideas about, about things, and it's just a real uh, nothing intimidated about it when we work. As I said, just like when we work on his albums, it's, we kind of carry the same thing over to working with Joe D. Yeah, I, I think it's just another aspect of my career. It's, you know, we're all going to have that time in our career where our records aren't selling as, as good as they ought to be. I hope it never comes, but, but it ultimately it will. And it's, you know, in times that I don't want to work as much as I do and, and, you know, go to Little League ball games and stay at home with my kids, and that's coming down the road. So pr producing is, is, is definitely a, a venue and an avenue for me to stay in music and, and do some of the things that I love to do further down the road. And, and I'll, I'm going to get better at, at all of it. Uh, Tim's a huge part of, of making that work. He is the guy that says yes or no. He is the person that tells Byron or me the final decision, even though we, we yes, we have, we're the boss of the project. He's really the final say-so about things. And he's so smart to not fool with it. He knows that we all have our separate jobs and we all have our separate things that we do, and he lets it happen. And um, it will continue. It'll continue. It's going to be a career. He'll, he'll, he'll have a long career, um, and we're thankful for it. I can't tell you how happy I am to, to watch him go from Indian Outlaw to It's Your Love. When I look, sit back and think, well, gosh, this is way busy. This is a lot going on. But, and, and Faith and I talk about this all the time. It's, I think that if you stop and thought about how much you were doing and, and all these little things that you got going on that it might seem... A little crazy but I think if you if you just do it and then take your time that you have to yourself and have for your family and really take advantage of it I think that that it's it's a, a compartmentalizing I guess it's, it's when you have to do something you do it and you do it the best you can and when you're away from it you can let it go and deal with what you have to deal with then and I think that Faith and I both are good at doing that and, and uh, I think that's what makes it work and plus there's you know there's a light at the end of the tunnel I mean we we have a family we have children we have a a future we have things that we want to do with our life and, and things that we want to do with our kids and the ways that we want to raise them and, and a, a family plan if you will of what we want our life to be like so we know we have to work hard for that to happen in a world tim mcgraw this is the best of cmt showcase